welcome to this episode of the Mile Minute. I am Carmen Woodland. I am an online myofunctional therapist, and today I'm going to actually just drop you right into the middle of a free parent education class that I did recently called Six Things Parents Should Understand About Craniofacial Growth. This has been an incredibly popular uh, class, and since I only did it once, I wanted to make sure that other parents around the globe got to take advantage of it. So uh, walk, walk yourself through it, take the time to go through it, and of course, reach out to me if you have any questions, but more importantly, this is gonna teach you the six things what I really want you to tune into. It's gonna help you identify misguided craniofacial growth in your child, and it's gonna explain a lot of things. So uh, happy learning, and I will see you in the next episode of the Myo Minute. I am Carmen Woodland with Integrative Myofunctional Therapy, and I'm gonna be talking about six things every parent should understand about craniofacial development. So in this master class, I'm going to show you or talk about things that you can watch for that are going to affect how your child develops, okay? How the face develops. By the end of our time together, you are going to learn six things that I really feel like, like these are the most important things that I think parents should understand about craniofacial development. But first let's talk about who am I and why am I qualified to be speaking with you today? I, uh, you might have known me, you might just be now getting to meet me. Um, I spend a ton of time speaking and educating people about this. I, by background, am a dental hygienist, and then I have integrated myofunctional therapy. So that's a large online global practice where I can bring this important therapy to people all over the globe. And then the other thing is, is I, I consider myself a pro with the kids because I work with tons and tons of them in my mini myo program. Um, I do want you to know this, though, if you're new to me, is that I really have a path of passion here to work with the kiddos and to be a voice for them because they don't know and a lot of parents don't know this information. So again, I spend tons of time talking about this. Sometimes I get a little bit fired up and have to dish out some parental tough love, but it really is all for the benefit of our children because they can't grow up to be extraordinary human beings if we overlook the important issues and if we don't give them everything that we can. Uh, a lot of you guys are here because you want to take advantage of the or the, the final beta testing offer for our new program, the Mommy, Mayo, and Me. I'm not going to talk about that at the beginning here. I'll wait till the end. But in the meantime, I encourage you to take notes. Use your work workbook, take notes, so that as I talk about these things, and you have thoughts or comments, keep them top of mind by writing them down so that if you do work with a myofunctional therapist, then you're going to have this information at your fingertips. Okay, so let's jump into the six things that every parent should understand about craniofacial development. The first thing, you guys, is that your child needs air. If you have an eye for an airway concern, this potentially can be life-saving for your kiddo, you know, down the road, but it also can be a big advantage for your child um, now. I'm gonna just cut right to the chase that snoring is not cute. Mouth breathing, not cute. Having a kiddo that sleeps and gasps at night is not cute. All of these things, mouth breathing, snoring, gasping, these are all sleep disordered breathing and it's important that you know it's not just a quirk or it's not just something cute that Johnny does. Another thing that is not cute, you guys, is nasty swollen tonsils. Um, these impede oxygen and it makes the dog house smaller, really, or it makes the, the house smaller. So I 100% I get it that many of you want to uh, avoid surgery by seeing if you can wait to see if the tonsils will shrink down. You want the tonsils to be in the body to do their job. But your child needs oxygen to be in their body doing their jo the job also. Um, so I really feel like that the oxygen is more important than the tonsils. Um, many of you ask me, will the tonsils shrink if my kid can start nasal breathing? And the beautiful answer is that yes, it probably can or potentially could, but the problem is, is this is like a hamster wheel. We normally can't establish nasal breathing because your kid is clogged up, 
can't get air. So it, it is, it's a vicious cycle. cycle. Um, no, you cannot just tape the mouth shut. This is a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. I know some people recommend it. I know some dentists will just say, yeah, just tape Johnny's mouth shut. Um, in my experience, what happens is you can create a, a problem with your kiddo and traumatize them where they don't even want the mouth closed anymore. So trying to get them to close their mouth when you've already traumatized them is going to be a problem. So I don't want you just to jump to that. Taping the mouth shut does not change the habit. So what can you do with this knowledge? How can you implement it? So the most important thing you can do is observe your kiddo. Um, have him or her turn sideways. Look at their profile. If you look at the nose, the upper lip, the lower lip, and the chin, does it slope backwards, okay? Um, so we call that a recessed chin. When the chin is back, guess what? The airway can be compromised also, so we don't get enough growth there. Another thing I want you to think about is, does your kids snore? Do they gasp for air? Do they have poor sleep? Are they grinding their teeth? even if your dentist told you that it was to that it was normal and they'll outgrow it okay so do they grind their teeth what about bedwetting issues behavior issues add adhd um restless sleep what about night terrors do uh, does your kid sleep in a funny position uh if you see them in the car and you look back and they have their head tipped we call that the cpr position because when somebody does cpr they tip the chin back to do what open the airway and your kiddo is trying to do the same thing so if you see your kids sleeping at night and they're in this backward c shape um, that's a big red flag for sleep apnea um, so we're going to talk about what i want you to do at the end but i want you to know this your child does not have a voice they do not have a dog in this fight and this is why i stress this so much um, you wouldn't ignore if your kiddo had a rash or a broken arm so do not ignore an airway dis distress problem because if your child doesn't breathe right, their face is not going to develop properly. Uh, let's talk about thing number two, tongue ties need diagnosed and fixed. Tongue ties matter, you guys. It is important to achieve good craniofacial development when the tongue is tied down, period. No ands, ifs, or buts. Um, the tongue cannot live in the roof of the mouth when it's living in the floor of the mouth also. So I'm going to talk about uh, correct oral rest posture here in just a second. So I'm not going to jump to that just yet. But I just want you to know that the tongue needs to be in the roof of the mouth, okay? Now there are very few okay tongue ties, in my opinion. I know that I preach a lot that we identify tongue ties based on myofunctional or on functional impairment, not restriction. But in my practice, I have very few cases where we just wait and see. I don't like that approach when it comes to um, the development of a child's face. So many of you guys already know this story, but this topic really hits home for me. It's pretty personal because my own granddaughter had a tongue tie and for years, Nobody knew that. Nobody dug any deeper. Um, she had three years of failed speech therapy. She had difficulty nursing. She had difficulty chewing and swallowing food without um, choking and gagging and vomiting on it. Um, she was an extremely restless sleeper. She had a steady diet of decongestants. And I even remember at the age, like six, five or six, she used to have to tote around her nebulizer so she could take a breathing treatment, okay? So people were just medicating her to solve the problems. Nobody ever looked a little bit further. So as soon as I did my training, I immediately knew that she had a tongue tie. So she did um, myofunctional therapy, we had a phrenectomy done. But the bottom line is, when we're talking about craniofacial development, she was altered by that tongue tie and she got it corrected at seven. So it definitely makes a difference. So what can you do to implement this knowledge? So the first thing I want you to think about is what symptoms does your child have? I am always surprised when parents say, yeah, my kid has this, 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 and they've just accepted that as the norm and they've never really dug any deeper. So you can get to work by going through the child assessment tool, which if you have your workbook, you can do that. If not, you can always go to the website and download the assessment tool. 
Uh, but most important, once you do that, then you're going to have a basic understanding. And once you have that basic understanding, I want you to seek out a myofunctional therapist, whether that's me or somebody else. We, as a profession, I say that we're the first line of defense because we get it. We understand it. We teach it. We preach it. We practice it. Um, not a lot of not a lot of doctors do get it. In. So quickly, I want to walk through how to talk with your doctor about a tongue tie. I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer here, but there's a pretty good chance you could go talk to your dentist, you could go talk to your pediatrician, and they might have zero understanding. They'll know what a tongue tie is, but they might have zero understanding about all of the concern. And some of them might think that it's not even a problem. I've had um, very highly educated specialists say, you only worried about you only worry about a tongue tie if there's a speech impediment. I had another dentist say you only worry about a tongue tie if your kid can't lick an ice cream cone. That's not right. So other than learning about it at school, a lot of specialists have had little exposure about it. So first, I want you to get comfortable asking questions. Okay, do they understand ties? Uh, how many do they do? Are they on adults or children? I don't like my clients to be guinea pigs, so if you call somebody and they just uh, see babies, I don't want my adult patients to go there because a lot of providers will say, well, yeah, I, know, I mostly do babies, but I can go ahead and do yours. There is a big difference. So if, you, if it's not their jam that they're going to do your age, then I don't, that's not a good choice for you. Um, what about OMT? So OMT stands for oral facial myofunctional therapy. So that's what I do, myofunctional therapy. Do they mention it? That's a really important thing. Um, so one of the reasons that I want you to start with a myofunctional therapist is because we educate you. We're going to help you understand things. We're going to help you understand the questions to ask so that when you ask a question about a tongue tie about myofunctional therapy and your doctor looks at you like you've got three eyeballs, you know enough, you're confident enough in what you know that you can run away. You know that that person isn't right for you. It's really important to have the right person for the job. Um, you do not want them dusting off their laser from the back of the, the office and offering to do your phrenectomy, so no. Uh, I can tell you this, in all of my years as a hygienist, very rarely did I ever see a phrenectomy done because um, of a tongue tie. Most of the time a phrenectomy was done for gum recession, so they would do a phrenectomy right down here on the front. So this makes me extremely sad, of course, now since I've left dentistry and I'm now, you know, wholly in my functional therapy. It makes me really sad because this should not happen. So let's talk about Declan. So Declan was 11 and he was a hygiene patient of mine and as you can see he has an obvious tie so this is what i call low hanging fruit you guys now declan had been going to the dentist religiously since he was um, two years old so he had gone with his brothers and sisters every six months so think about first of all the frustration and the disbelief from his mom when the first time I meet them, the first time I see him, I go out, I get her from the waiting room and I bring her back to talk about his tongue tie. Now, the family knew that something was wrong because they called it his butt tongue. Uh, and so they teased him about it and joked, but not one time had anybody ever said that it was a concern. And so this was kind of the disbelief and the frustration of the mom is because here's this new hygienist saying this is a concern and then but he's been seeing the same dentist you know for 17 18 times and nobody has mentioned this so a hundred percent this is unacceptable you guys every single dental hygienist dentist um speech therapist people who are working around our youth and who work uh, around the mouth they should be identifying and talking about this obvious condition now, Declan's is obvious. Not everybody's is always obvious, which is why a myofunctional therapist is going to help you with that because a lot of dentists will look at um, the tongue tie. They'll, they'll look at the tip of the tongue, whereas my focus is on the back of the tongue. So that's really why I encourage a myofunctional therapist to be your first stop. Uh, the other thing is, is I want you to know that as a mom, I get that we're supposed to just love our kids as they are, but I'm here to tell you that you have to ask questions. If something doesn't seem right, 
ask questions. If you don't see, uh, if your kid's facial development doesn't seem right, if there's a speech impediment, it, it is so important. So you have to be willing to investigate. Okay, I got a little bit long-winded on that one. You can tell I, I spend a lot of time in tongue ties. Let's talk about thing number three, which is your child needs correct oral, uh, oral rest posture. So this is tongue up, mouth closed, teeth not clenched, but I say about a millimeter apart and then lips sealed. So the tongue needs to be up to spread the maxilla out. The maxilla is the upper jaw. The tongue is nature's expander. Also, when the tongue is up, if you feel right behind the top front teeth, we, we call it the spot. That's a vagus nerve ending. So it's a little, I call it a speed bump right up behind the top front teeth. That vagus nerve ending is so important. The vagus nerve helps regulate breathing. It helps regulate digestion, anxiety, depression, mood, um, just to name a few things. So when somebody has a low resting tongue posture, whether it's just because of myofunctional impairment or it's because of a tongue tie, guess what? That is not getting stimulated. So um, I have clients that have you know anxiety, depression, that kind of stuff. But also if you think of a kid who sucks their thumb, where does the thumb stimulate? Right on that same spot. Now also when we're talking about oral rest posture, the lips need to be closed. So first of all for nasal breathing, it's really hard to have your mouth open and be nasal breathing. It's like rubbing your belly and patting your head. Uh, but the other thing is is that the lips need to be closed to help guide the teeth into place. So those big old buck teeth that you see, very often if you see them and they're sticking out, that's because the lips are parted. They lose their strength when they're apart. So that can lead to those, the teeth sticking out. The other thing parted lips can do is lead to what we call an incompetent lip, which means that the lip can no longer comfortably close. So for some of my clients, getting the lips together is extremely difficult. And part of the problem with that is, is that this muscle here on the upper lip, uh, it shortens. So it's really working against nature, if you will, to get the lips closed. So I always compare this to um, somebody who walks around on their tiptoes. If they walk around on their tiptoes, they can't comfortably put their foot flat. And the same thing happens with the lip. Now the other thing with chronic open mouth resting posture is that it can lead to an open bite because the molars will continue to grow. So an open bite means, and it can an open bite can be on the front, it can be on the side, but it just means that the teeth don't come together. But very common in people who have an open mouth resting posture, their teeth are further apart than they should be. The back molars want to continue reaching for something, so they continue to grow. So we've got longer teeth in the back, which means that the front teeth no longer come together, which means you can't bite into a sandwich or something like that where your teeth need to come together. All right, so what can you do with this knowledge? Again, watch your child. So from the moment, this information of mine hits your ears, you should be gently guiding your child. So if you see them with their mouth open, you need to remind Johnny or Susie to close their mouth, um, lips together. Now, your kiddo might not genuinely understand that the tongue needs to be up, but, and, and really, we want the tongue plastered in the roof of the mouth like a Wonder Bread press, like if you were squishing bread up there. But if you can get your kid to close their mouth, and nasal breathe, then that's making some of the biggest changes. The other thing is parents don't want to harp on their kids. So I get a lot of parents that say, um, Johnny's really delicate and doesn't like me harping on him. And so I, the only comparison I can say is if you have a child who is using foul language, you're not going to grow tired of correcting that. So the same with this. Your kid doesn't look at it like that. They just are learning that, oh, oh, I need to close my mouth. The other thing is modeling it too. So when I get parents that are huge mouth breathers and now we're trying to get the kids to correct their oral rest posture, what do you think they're seeing? So uh, I, I think you need to get used to comfortably correcting your kid. And it doesn't need to be loud or obnoxious, it just needs to happen and consistently. Because the more consistently that your kid hears it, the more they're gonna put that into uh, action. All right, thing number four, you guys, is encourage your child to chew. This is probably weird for you, uh, unless, of course, you've read The Dental Diet, but chewing real food creates good facial growth. 
So this book has been out for a couple years now, but since it came out, I am always flooded with people across the world asking questions about this. So as parents, we are very often the person who exacerbates the myofunctional impairment problem uh, without knowing it. So we get a kiddo who doesn't want to eat a bunch of things, so we give them pureed food. Uh, we give them pureed baby food. We give them smoothies and yogurt and chicken nuggets, things that are really easy to eat. And we give that to them because we want them to eat. We want them to have some nutrition. Uh, kids need to chew. That's the important thing. So you can research um, baby led weaning, that kind of stuff. But I always encourage parents, especially those who contact me and they've got real young kids, to make their kids eat real food. So don't cook it to death. Don't feed them processed and ready-made foods because those are easy. Um, don't chop everything into teeny tiny pieces, okay? So we tend to do that. We overcook it and then we chop it into these little tiny pieces. So what can you do with this knowledge? First, I want you to make your kids eat food. Now, very often, um, gagging, um, problems with textures, this is caused by muscle weakness or a tongue tie. So I don't want you to just totally overlook it and say that Tommy is picky. Uh, because I have a lot of clients who, once they have their phrenectomy done and they go through myofunctional therapy, I have them go back and start experimenting with a lot of different foods. And a lot of them discover that they can eat things now that they couldn't before. So they, um, they weren't necessarily picky so much, they just had trouble. Because when the tongue is tied down, it can't help manipulate the food, it can't do its job. So that makes it really difficult. Um, so the other thing is, is if your child's a rapid eater, so I get lots of kids that eat like a vacuum, they don't chew their food well, they don't chew it bilaterally, and parents will often just say, well, Johnny's picky, but I want you to dig a little bit deeper. Are there certain things that they're avoiding? Do they not want to eat that pork chop because it's difficult? So if somebody has a tongue tight, it's like, eating with a resistance band. So a lot of those kids just say no. I mean, I've had clients that go all the way up to, you know, under 40, like age 37 is one I'm thinking of, that every decision she made was based upon how easy it was gonna to be to chew something. Um, so I just want you to remember that good chewing stimulates growth. So if your kiddos are young, chew, chew, chew food, make them work. Uh, thing number five, your child needs nasal breathing. The bottom line is, in somebody who's mouth breathing, and this is for an adult also, this uh, means a slow, steady decline in health. So first of all, the first thing is, if you're mouth breathing, you can't have correct oral rest posture. So there's that. And then also, if you're mouth breathing, um, that's chronic sympathetic overdrive. So you or your kid are constantly in fight or flight mode. You're constantly running from that saber tooth tiger and you can't get that relax, that rest and digest, that balance of the parasympathetic nervous system when you are mouth breathing. Um, another thing is when we're talking about craniofacial development, when somebody is a mouth breather the and the mouth is hanging open, the face grows long and narrow. So it grows down instead of growing more forward and out. I always say that we're supposed to correctly develop looking like Disney princes or something, you know, with that forward strong facial features, um, the angled, you know, a strong jawline. But if you look at this picture here, this is somebody at seven and you can see the long facial um, express or the long facial development, um, the flat cheekbones. I can look at the eyes and see that there wasn't adequate development of this mid face, which is also um, the floor of the eye socket, if you will. So it has a, a drastic effect. You can also look at my facial structure. I have that long, narrow face. I have a high, narrow palate. I have this steep jawline. Um, I was a mouth breather. Many of you guys know that. I was a lifelong mouth breather, and it, it shows right here on my face. So let's go back to mouth breathing extremely unhealthy. Your nose is meant to do so many critical jobs. Clean the air, um, moisturize the air. But another thing that a lot of people don't know about is nitric oxide, which is found in the sinuses. So when you nasal breathe and you get that nitric oxide, it helps the uptake of oxygen into the body. So we all get um, better oxygenation. So mouth breathing 
is one of the most unhealthy things that you can do. So how do you implement this knowledge? First, observe your kid. Is it obvious? Is their mouth hanging open? Um, does your kid chew with their mouth open? This is a biggie for parents because a lot of parents will say, my kid has these terrible table manners, but it's not all about table manners. It's that your kid wants to eat dinner and not turn blue. So they want air and to digest their burrito. So that's really a big red flag and a lot of parents don't realize that. Um, one of the biggest things that I must know when I start working with a kid and an adult is if they can nasal breathe. If somebody cannot physically nasal breathe, then we need an ENT. We need an allergist that is going to help um, with the congestion. It's going to help with that mouth breathing. A um, lot of my mamas don't want to medicate, and I totally get that, but sometimes we have to medicate momentarily so that we can break, the, break that vicious mouth breathing cycle. So keep that in mind. Um, sometimes I get kiddos that have sleep apnea and moms are, are reluctant to medicate also. So hopefully, you know, my goal is always to get everybody off of meds, but sometimes we need them up front to get started. Uh, other things that you can look for. Open mouth, obvious, um, dry chap lips, low tongue. So if you see your kid's tongue, if you can see it, it's not where it needs to be. Um, does your child have a puffy appearance? Do they have that lower lip rolling out? And those are just some things to name a few. Uh, thing number six, okay, uh, schedule an early ortho visit. So this is probably the biggest area that catches parents off guard. And that's because it's quite different from the conventional route to ortho. Um, depending on your age, like my age, there was a certain way you moved into braces, if you will, and that was you became a preteen or a teen, you got all your permanent teeth, and then it was time to get braces. A lot of dentists who do not understand all of this stuff, they will have you wait until around 10 to 12, and then they'll refer you down to Joe on the corner, maybe the same person that they've been referring to for, you know, 500 years. That is why it's so different for parents to wrap their mind around this. Uh, the things that I want you to know is that by age six, your child's face is 80% developed. So that's the maxilla and the mandible. By age seven to 12, 90% of that growth is complete. Uh, girls tend to be a little bit faster than boys, but age seven might be a geriatric patient in the ortho world. So there are some very exceptional uh, orthodontists out there that say, you know, by the time you bring a kid to the orthodontist at age seven, which is um, typical, that, like that's the standard of care for the, I think it's from the Orthodontist Association that says that every child by the age of seven should have this screening. So that might be a little bit late in some cases. So it's important to take advantage of time sensitive growth windows. So that's when they're younger. You have to act early. Uh, it's no longer a rite of passage into teenagerhood because this stuff should already be looked at long before. So it, it needs to happen sooner. So before I start talking about what you can do with this knowledge, if you're multitasking, come back to me because of the six, I think this is probably the most important because it's so, um, the thought process is so different. So I really want you to catch this. So what do you do with this information? The biggest thing is, is it, it's going to take a little bit of work. It's a little elbow grease, but you first have to observe and watch for misguided cranial facial growth. So I no longer want parents to look at tooth crowding, say, and say, oh, well, Johnny just has dad's crappy teeth. So this isn't necessarily a genetic thing. I want you to look at crowded teeth as a sign of the, the face is not growing properly. So we have insufficient craniofacial growth. So a great thing to do is have your kid come up to you. They can get in front of you and they can tip their head back and look at their teeth. If the baby teeth are touching, there's about a 0% chance, you guys, that those teeth, that the adult teeth are going to come in right. So we're all supposed to have what's called leeway and primate spacing, which basically means gaps in all of our baby teeth so that they're holding space for the bigger adult teeth to come in. If you have a child who already has those teeth that are touching, Houston, we have a problem. So that's the first thing, that, that's what I mean by um, watching for misguided craniofacial growth because it is not okay for a dentist to say, oh, the teeth are crowded, Johnny's gonna need braces. 
Johnny needs to, to address that now, not later. So the first thing that you'll have to do is seek out an airway focused orthodontist. Now I'm not going to talk a ton about this, but I recently did uh, write a popular blog on this. So we'll make sure to link to that here. Um, but I caution you guys, this is not somebody who is on every street corner, might not even be in your town or, or maybe even in your state. That's a real possibility. This is somebody who will look at your kiddo as a whole structural unit and not cosmetically straighten the teeth. Okay, so you've got to get your mind away from the orthodontist that all of your other children have gone to, um, potentially the orthodontist that your dentist is going to refer you to. It's important to understand that if you have a child who has misguided craniofacial growth, this is going to be the first step. These people are going to look at what's the cause. Why is there already crowding? Uh, is there an airway issue? These are exceptional orthodontists and they want to know why your child has issues. They don't care. In fact, the last thing they care about is your child to have a straight smile. Um, they, they don't want to physically crank the teeth around until everything is correct. So this is really where parents check out on me because they just know it's going to take time, it's going to take effort, and it's gonna, they don't like to do what's uncomfortable or unknown. So it's important to seek out the right person. It's gonna cost some money. You're gonna have to be open to traveling, but I feel like our kids are worth it. I have some kids in some states that travel two states away to see a specialist, so that's really important. Now, in that blog that I was talking about, I give the names of some excellent, excellent people here in the US. I want you to find that blog, look at those websites and see where those doctors are. And I get that they're probably not in your back door or in your backyard, but you can see, you can contact those offices and say, hey, here's where I live. Do you know somebody who can help me? So you might realize that the world just really is a small place. Uh, the other thing is when you're searching for an airway orthodontist, if you look at somebody's website and something about sleep, something about breathing, something about myofunctional therapy, if that is not front and center, you guys, this is not their specialty. If it's on the last page, the last paragraph and lettering this big, this is a huge thing. This is an epidemic. The mouth breathing, the sleep problems, the sleep apnea in our children. This is, it's really a big concern. And so if somebody is not putting that front and center, then they are not the right person for you. And also if they don't know anything about myofunctional therapy and if they don't recommend it or mandate it, then it's not the right person. So a great airway orthodontist very likely is going to uh, have you or your child be able to close the mouth and nasal breathe before they ever even think about straightening the teeth because they know that it's more important to worry about that than worrying about straight teeth because the teeth won't stay straight. So this means when it comes to the breathing and that kind of stuff that I'm generally the first to stop. So that's what I want you to know about that. Super important. And like I said, it's the, the spot where parents always just check out because they know it's going to be a little bit difficult. Uh, okay, so how can I make a difference for my child? So that might be what you're thinking now. So first of all, watch for misguided growth and concerns. Catch things early. What I don't want you to do is assume that your child is different or that your child is as good as he or she can get because that's not the facts. Um, I've had several parents who come to me. They've had kids who have been in braces multiple times. Um, I've had clients who have kiddos who, or even teens, you guys, who have had expansion. They've had, you know, all of this stuff done and nobody ever tells them that it's not right. And so the parents just assume that that's just the, the best that, you know, Sally Joe is going to be. I want you to get comfortable with saying, mm, that doesn't sit well with me. So I want you to watch for misguided growth and concerns. Number two, do not be afraid to get second opinions or third opinions or fourth opinions. I don't care. Until this stuff sits on your heart and your brain as if it makes sense, then you're not talking to the right person. So asking questions. So if you're interviewing a new orthodontist, as you should be interviewing them, just as they're saying if you're an ideal client, um, ask the orthodontist, do they do retractive orthodontics, which means pulling the face back um, do, or pulling the jaw back? 
Do they extract teeth to fix crowding issues? Many of you guys either have had this done or you've had somebody in your family uh, or maybe one of your kids where they say, oh, your kid's teeth are crowded. We need to pull some out to make more room. The fact of the matter is when you pull teeth out of a small mouth, you make a smaller mouth. So it's that's unacceptable in the airway for most cases, uh, if not all in the airway ortho world. So definitely you wanna be asking about that. And then ask them if they understand the concepts behind um, airway focused orthodontics and do they believe the philosophy. If you ask them if they know about this and they say yes, but then if you ask them if they believe in the philosophy and they say, no, I think it's a bunch of hocus pocus, that would be a concern to me. So ask questions. If the orthodontist routinely uses extraction or retraction as a way to solve their problems, this isn't your person, okay? I, I encourage you to move on to another orthodontist, even if it costs you money, even if it costs you to travel, and even if it costs you time, your kiddo is worth it. You need somebody who is going to focus on your child growing properly, regardless of the teeth, okay? So that's important. The other thing is, is ask questions to the tongue tie doctor. Typically when I call somebody a tongue tie doctor, that means they know what the heck they're doing. But if you're asking somebody um, if your child has a tongue tie, if you have a tongue tie, ask those questions that I already talked about. Do you feel comfortable with their opinion? What's their method? I don't care about the method. I more care about the expertise behind the tool. Uh, if you have sent, ask a doctor about a tongue tie and they tell you that it only matters if they can't lick an ice cream cone, no. If you ask somebody about it, it uh, a tongue tie and they say, well, it only matters if you have a speech impediment, no. First of all, we don't diagnose anything these days ba based on one thing, so to me that's extremely closed-minded, but it's important to ask questions. A very well-educated um, person who understands tongue ties is certainly gonna know about myofunctional therapy and they're going to, some of them are going to mandate it. Uh, we're not lucky enough to have everybody mandate it, but I think someday we will. The other thing is, is I don't want you to be intimidated by the perception that this person knows more than you. Um, this person can have every letter in the alphabet behind their name. I still want you to ask questions, okay? Um, that's really hard because a lot of people just feel like it's a disrespectful thing if they ask questions, but you're gonna be really ticked off when you find out that that person has led you wrong and they were a doctor or they were a specialist. It also depends on you know how old are they? What is their level of knowledge? You know, Do they stay up to date on continuing ed things? Those type of things. It, it can take 17 years to change, uh, to cause a paradigm shift. So if you're talking to a dentist that's a dinosaur, then probably they're not gonna know or care about myofunctional impairment. They're not gonna care about tongue ties. They're certainly not gonna know and understand. For the most part, I don't think that they will. Um, airway ortho, that kind of stuff. So get comfortable. I know it's going to take time and effort to do two or three or four opinions, but until something makes sense to you, do not jump out of the frying pan into the flame because it's not the right thing for your kiddo. All right, and then the third thing is to see a myofunctional therapist sooner rather than later. Uh, the first step is to have your child completely assessed. This will look at breathing, sleeping, chewing, swallowing, speaking, posture, so many different things. Uh, a myofunctional therapist will complete this and they're gonna help, they're, they're gonna be the hub of the wellness wheel. So they help you build your comprehensive health team because every kid's gonna need it. Whether, whether it's small or whether it's big. I mean, there's times where I get off the, uh, a consult or an exam with somebody and I say, get a, an appointment with an allergist, get an appointment with an ENT, you need to see uh, an airway orthodontist and you need a sleep study. You know, that's very common. So a myofunctional therapist is going to be your person. They will help you build a plan. They will help you figure out what to do when. I don't care what anybody says, there are some things that matter. And that means that if, if I've got somebody with expansion and they have a, an appliance in the roof of their mouth, I cannot send my client to have a phrenectomy because they can't create a suction. A suction is important for healing, a suction is important for swallowing, so it's really, really important. It can bring therapy to a dead stop. So having that person is going to help take the overwhelm out of it and help guide you. 
Okay, so let's wrap it up and summarize. So the six things that I really want parents to understand about craniofacial development. Thing one, your child needs air, okay? Number two, tongue ties need diagnosed and fixed. So if you're wondering about this with your kiddo, you've got to address it sooner rather than later. Uh, number three, your child needs correct oral rest posture. Tongue up, mouth closed, lips sealed. Uh, number four, encourage your child to chew food. So this is good, hearty, wholesome food. Number five, your child needs nasal breathing. So that means help them. Um, are you contributing to the problem? Do you give them dairy and they have trouble with dairy? If dairy makes them congested, you have to help take that out of the diet, regardless of how much work it, ca um, it causes you. If you have a kiddo who's sensitive to animals, you can't let Fluffy sleep on the pillow. I mean, it's hard enough to get a, a mouth breathing child to switch over to nasal breathing uh, that we can't continue to set them up for unsuccess by overlooking these other things. So those are important things to think about. Um, thing number six is schedule an early ortho visit. So super duper important. Like I said, I think that's probably the most important out of all six because it's the most foreign to parents. Okay, so thank you for joining. Um, this information combined with your workbook um, or the child assessment tool, if you've done that for your kid, it should give you some, uh, some guidance. If you have questions, you know where to find me. You, uh, here in just a minute, I'll be sharing my email. Um, we'll make sure and post those blog posts here uh, below where you're watching this video. If you're live here now, obviously you won't see it, but we'll post it in Facebook. I will make sure that those are there. And then if you are not here to hear, uh, to learn about Mommy, My Own, Me, then you're out of here. So feel free to go. Um, if not, I'm going to go ahead and continue on so we can get out of here. Um, so let's talk about Mommy, My Own, Me. Many of you guys have received your invitation about the program. Uh, and this could be because of the mailing list. Um, somebody might have shared it with you. So, um, but some of you are probably hearing about it for the first time. So let's talk about the program. So in this program, it's an implementation program. Really, um, really it's the only one out there that shows you exactly how to give your child a head start on myofunctional issues by learning how to implement game-based fun activities that you get to implement at home. The whole family can benefit from them. In this program, you're going to um, strengthen muscles. You're going to build coordination. You're going to identify poor habits. You're going to create new ones. So we're going to rewrite the hard drive, if you will. We're going to create lifelong skills, uh, or that's the hope anyhow. And, and I hope you're going to have a lot of fun with it. So this offer that we have right now is for our final critique of the program. We've broken it into two implementation workshops that I'm going to teach live just like this. Uh, so overall, it will be 12 total sessions. So you can do the first one or the second one. So you can see here on this slide. Um, so it comes with the six lessons, the parent workbook and the parent success guide. So in that parent workbook is not only that, like the homework sheets, the check off things, uh, any resource that we need you to have. And then I give blow by blow details of the exercises. So not only do I do them and demonstrate them, but I also give written instructions because some people like to learn that way too. And then you can see also that then there's alumni pricing for the second workshop. So ultimately these are meant to build upon each other uh, when we're done with this, we will launch the program worldwide. So once we make, you know, go through all of this, we get everybody's feedback. When we launch that, then that price is going to be $4.97. So if you're on the fence, um, I don't want you to wait because I, we absolutely will close the offer on March 1st because the program starts on March 2nd. Um, okay, so here's how it will work. We've already set the dates and you can look on any of my social media and see those. All lessons are going to be taught in a private Facebook group so that all the parents who are enrolled can access those. These lessons that I teach aren't necessarily meant for you and your child to be there. They're more so instruction for me and the parent so that the parent can understand um, the why, why you're doing this, how, how to do it, um, how to make how to break it down into manageable pieces for your child. 
This is so important because the parent has to understand it to be able to implement the games and the exercises at home. So all of these will be recorded and they will be posted in the Facebook group. So I, I know that a lot of you won't be able to be there live and that's fine. Now each lesson is going to be taught two weeks apart, but in real life, you're going to do these exercises with your kiddo for about a month. So this, in my mini myo program, it is once a month for a year. So this is really gonna be the same. Uh, when we talk about building strength and coordination for your child, I'm not asking for your child just to demonstrate that they can stick their tongue out or do A, B, and C. I'm asking that for them to do it. And it's much like you go to the gym, you work with a trainer. They don't just say, hey, show me how to do a bicep curl. They ask you to do it. So that's why you'll do these exercises longer than what we teach. Um, this is not meant to be therapy. So remember, this is meant to give your child a head start if he or she can't do traditional therapy at this time or if they're too young. Um, so here is my email. So I talked about that earlier. You can use it for a couple reasons. A, if you have questions that don't get answered here in just a minute, I'm going to do a Q and A if you have questions that don't get answered. Um, but if you want to get enrolled in this program before March 1st, then you would email at this address and then we will send you the offer to accept and pay. Um, so again, all dates are set. Um, Workshop two is tentatively gonna start in July. So we'll set those dates here pretty soon. So I'm going to jump into some questions. Um, if you have questions that I don't cover, you can either post them here and I will scour to look for those. Or if you wanna make sure that you get it answered, email to that address because like I said, we're not absolutely not gonna make any exceptions to extend this past March 1st because um, the first lesson of Mommy My Own Meat will start on March 2nd. So let's talk about the ideal age. I have been bombarded with this, um, and this is really a tough number to nail down because there's a lot of variables. So I'm gonna try and unpack it here and make sure that it makes sense. So in my mini myo program, I start therapy with kids around age four or five, depending on their needs, their maturity level, their level of cooperation. I always stress that it's important that a child be old enough to cooperate, comply, and comprehend therapy. Um, now that's therapy. Remember, we're talking about fun games and um, game-based exercises, so it's a little bit different. So first of all, that's one of the reasons that this program was needed is because there are so many parents that are emailing me. They know their kid's too young, but the parents are on board. They know that there's something that they need to do, so they want to make changes. They want to help their child have the best possible cranial facial development that they can. Um, but their kid, I was telling them that their kid was too young. So the parents would say, well, can you help me? Are there any tips or tricks that, that will give my kid a head start? So really for somebody like a two year old, there's gonna be a lot of things here that, um, that I teach that you can teach, that you can break down into pieces that your kid can do. I tested a lot of what I teach on with my young granddaughter who is two. Uh, sometimes she can do them, sometimes she can't. Again, remember, I'm giving you tools so that as your kid grows, you can constantly dig in this tool chest and find things. So a two-year-old is gonna be do, able to do some of it, some of it they can't, but you're gonna still have that knowledge for down the road. I will also make modifications for parents who have older kids, younger kids, um, you know, some of the kids that are older, they might be doing the same type of exercise, but they don't necessarily want the kiddo terms or the, you know, the game terms. So again, in part of my instruction, I will be going over that with parents so that they know how they can make changes. Um, I also built this program for parents who have a variety of age of kids and finances are a concern. So um, I've had families with as many as seven kids and they say, Carmen, I want to do something. I want to make a difference, but I, I just can't afford to do all of that. So this is a great stepping stone um, for somebody who has a lot of kids or even if financial concerns are an issue. One thing I do want you to consider is if you have kids over age five, I, I, I love for you to do this program, but I would also encourage them to have a comprehensive exam. I know that's an expense. Uh, it's 125 bucks to do it with me, but the reason I want that done 
is because I am the opportunity to teach you about concerns with your kid or I am the opportunity to catch things early. And, and a, a great example is I have had several families where I want to do an exam with all of the kids and the ones that the parents didn't have a lot of concerns about are the ones that get diagnosed with sleep apnea. So that's why I want it. I don't want your kid to do my program and not give me the opportunity to identify big concerns. So that airway, the misguided craniofacial growth. I mean, really, I hope that I've taught you something in this lesson that you wouldn't do that, but that's why I encourage anybody over five, do an exam so at least we know. Um, because your child might enroll to do this program, but I might still say, okay, your kid has sleep apnea concerns, they need to do this, this, and this. So we do not want to overlook sleep disordered breathing concerns at all. Um, I think also that this program is great for kiddos who are going to do traditional therapy with me, but they can't right now. So I've got some kids that are waiting on a sleep study, and believe it or not, in some states, I have clients who wait months for a sleep study. Um, in, in some countries, I have clients who wait months and months to be able to do this. So I have other um, other kiddos who their parents are saving money for traditional therapy. So some of the traditional therapy will cover this stuff and a lot of it it won't because again, my traditional therapy is meant for a different group of people. So all kids are going to benefit. Uh, parents ultimately will benefit too because I always get parents that say, when I try and do this stuff with my kids, it's hard for me too. So, um, so that's the the best answer that I can give about ideal age. Um, is this going to prevent therapy? No, uh, I would never tell you that. This program is meant to be a bridge program, so it, it's meant to get your kids started. It's meant to give you the tools to help your two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, your kids that are too young, it's meant to help those because so many people with those age of kids were reaching out and wanting to do something. So it's not necessarily um, going to prevent other therapy and I don't want you to think that. Who is it designed for? Uh, I think I just touched on this. Uh, financial, people with financial concerns, young kids, a lot of kids where they just can't do traditional therapy right now. Uh, is it gonna be recorded? Yes, so it will be recorded and then it will be put onto the Facebook page so you can watch it uh, whenever you can, whenever you can get around to it. Um, what happens if I get off track? Um, this is going to happen. Absolutely. Life happens. Uh, when you get off track, I want you to get back on track as soon as possible. So remember, there is no coupon expiration date here. So kids will normally do a lesson for a month. Uh, so that gives you plenty of time to get off track and to get back on. But these are not things that you're going to do with your kid once and then walk away. These are tools tools for the tool chest. You're going to do these over and over. So ideally, you will do these routinely with your kid, just over and over, different things. Uh, I am a grown adult and I'm still constantly doing some of these things. So I think that if you get off track, you just have to get over it and then show back, you know, get back on track and continue working. With that said, it is so important that parents show up to help their kid, okay? you have to do the work. I have a lot of uh, kiddos in Mini Mile and the parents are flaking, the parents aren't putting the effort forth and I can't help the kid if the parents don't do that. So I think that's the most important thing. I do try and make it um, manageable time-wise so that it's not putting a big damper on lifestyle. Uh, can we add workshop two after we do workshop one? Unfortunately, that's not gonna happen. After this initial offer, then we won't offer the program as one and two. Uh, it's going to be that 12 lesson program. How long will we have access to the material? This is a good question. So you're going to have the workbook, so download those and you have those uh, for life. So that gives you the detailed step-by-step -step information. Uh, the agreement that you sign when you go into the program says that you will have access to the Facebook group for a minimum of 16 weeks. This is more or less just because it was legally, you know, what we want to make sure that we deliver on our end. 
Um, I'm trying to figure out what we will do after that fact. I think what we're going to do is people who pay for session one and two, they will automatically be migrated into Kajabi, which will be our online delivery program. And those people will have lifelong access of the program or lifetime access to the program's lifetime, if you will, and all updates, that kind of stuff. Um, people who only do session one, they will be limited to what's in the Facebook group. So the, the most important thing that I want you to remember is we have bribed you with this incredible price to give us the feedback. So we want you to, uh, to finish it. We want your feedback. We want you to implement. So that's really important to us. Um, we are going to worry about the details really after we get done with the beta testing of the program. Um, dates, are there dates set for workshop two? Tentatively, yes, they're going to start July 6th and I believe they're every two weeks after that. Um, is the enrollment time frame, what is the enrollment time frame? Um, so doors will close March 1st. So after that, it's going to go into the full program of 12 lessons and our our price for this year will be $4.97, so you can see that if you want to do it, you don't want to wait. So again, here are the prices. There is the email. Um, if you have any questions that didn't get asked, certainly reach out to me. I'm going to let you get out of here. I'm ready to get out of here, so I'm really thankful that you are here. I hope you learned something today, and uh, if you know somebody who needs this information, Definitely share it, and I hope to see you inside of the Mommy My On Me program. So I'll see you guys later. Thanks for being here.